Bibles this morning and open them to Ecclesiastes chapter 9. I'm going to finish this, this great chapter, and it's been a great series over the book of Ecclesiastes, a desire to, to understand what this world is about, especially in, in a life without Christ, and yet particularly what it means to be in Christ, as Solomon has, has searched and used and applied his wisdom to the things we call life. Let us begin with prayer. Father, we again thank you so much for the joy it is to, to be a living sanctuary, to be a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto you. We, uh, we pray that for our souls this morning, or that we were able to set aside the cares of this world, knowing that, that they bring anxious thoughts and fears. Sometimes they cripple us and they, they make us immobile, and, and yet, Lord, the safest place we can be is square in the center of your godliness. Thank you for the very fact that you've given us life in Christ Jesus, that, that we can be this living sacrifice, that we can, we can face the world with boldness. Nothing that we've done. All the work of Christ on the cross that has empowered the believer to, to walk in the power of the Spirit, and we marvel at that. We marvel at the fact that you are so kind to us that as Scripture says, that even though we were yet sinners, you, Christ, died for us, demonstrating a love that is unconditional, that is based on the giving of blood so a person can receive forgiveness of their sins. May that help us as we approach your word and may you speak forth and may you speak loudly as we look at the Scriptures your very word and spreed, inspired. So teach us, Spirit, teach us. We thank you and pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. It's been a couple of weeks since we've been in the book of Ecclesiastes. Just want to remind you a little bit about the last time we were together in this book, we were looking at the, the wisdom of Solomon, of course, inspired by God, and he pretty much said, enjoy life. Enjoy the, the goodness that God and kindness that he's given you that, that you can embrace life in the way that God sees it. And the reason he gave us such exhortation as we looked at it a couple weeks ago was because life is uncertain. It has its turns and its twists and it's unexpected at times. Life is uncertain, not that Life fools God, understand, it, it fools us, but it doesn't fool a sovereign God, or anything happens outside his omniscience or sovereignty, and so in light of his, his, his characteristics, we, we live this life, and at times does surprise us, but like I said, it never surprises an omniscient, sovereign God, but from a human perspective, life seems to come at us with uncertainty, no stability. We never know what will happen next. Disaster can strike at any time, including the moment when we least expect it. Take, for example, I was going back through some of the clippings that I have saved over uh, my life, just grasping some of these things, and I came across this in my file. Is, there was a Californian by the name of Bob Cartwright who, in 2006, desired to attend a baseball playoff game in New York with some of his friends. A rich man owned his own plane, had his own pilot. And for some whatever reason, he knew that he couldn't go on that trip, and so he, he sent his pilot with his friends on to that trip. However, this plane and the uncertainty of life crashed into an apartment building, and all on board perished. Cartwright was quoted as saying, I was supposed to be on that plane, and he was no doubt evaluating the fact of, of his life and, and the circumstances of why he didn't go. However, the article went on to say that just a month later, Cartwright died in another plane crash near his California home with a replaced pilot that he had hired himself. Life is uncertain. It often begs the question, why? Here's another example. Donald Peters, who bought two Connecticut lottery tickets on November 1st, 2008, just as he had done for 20 years, lived in a mobile home. It was custom that him and his wife would buy. He would buy one for himself and one for his wife. 
And he would do that every week. As it turned out, one of his tickets hit the lottery. Worth $10 million. But Mr. Peters was not able to claim his winnings because he died of a heart attack later on that very day before he was able to turn in his winning ticket. Seems kind of trivial. But I think it just exemplifies that, that life can be mysterious at times. However, the writer of Ecclesiastes, Solomon himself, wouldn't have been surprised by this as we look at the scriptures. He wouldn't have been surprised by this for what he says in verse 11. Look at it there in chapter 9. At the end, he says, for time and chance overtake them all. He understood that uncertainty was part of life. It came at him at, in, in various ways, and he couldn't grasp it or put it in a box. He couldn't determine the events of his life. He couldn't events, determine the events of what was to come. Everything seemed uncertain. Now, for us, I think, at times, uncertainty can be frustrating. I've married a woman who, who is very organized and, and desires to have her ducks in a row, and, and sometimes... I bring uncertainty into her life. Or maybe that's all the time, huh, bud? We don't like chaos. We want to control things. We want to, want to shape things. However, in this fallen world, Psalm 1 has already given us a biblical understanding when it comes to, to the uncertainty of life. Look back to verse 2, just to jog your memory. He says it's the same for all. It's the same for all. It's the same for the wicked and the righteous. There is one fate for the righteous and, and for the wicked. Rain falls on the just and the unjust. Solomon tells us that, that often the same things happen to everyone, no matter if they are righteous or wicked. And verse 11 takes the same basic principle and applies it to, the, to peoples of various talents. We looked at that a couple weeks ago. I want to remind you about it. Ordinarily, we would expect things to, to go well for people with, with strong abilities and strong talents, and often they do. However, having speed, strength, or wisdom doesn't always mean that you will win. Look at verse 11 with your eyes. It says there, it says, I again saw under the sun that the race is not to the swift, and the battle is not to the warriors. And neither is bread to the wise, nor wealth to the discerning, nor favor to men of ability. For time and chance overtake them all. Solomon takes a step book. He, he lists five different types of kinds of people and their, and their various skill sets. And, and he looks at it and he sees some win and some lose. And it's not predicated on their abilities or their talents I think to some degree we expect one with such talent would be winners of life. Yes, as he points out, at times they can turn out to be losers. I think it makes sense. Usually the fastest person wins the race, but, but not always. Of course, we think of the story of the, of the tortoise and the hare here, you know, the, that, that, that story of, of the wits of the, of the tortoise beating that which is faster than the hare. There's a greater example in, in scriptures, and this is pretty interesting. In 2 Samuel chapter 2, you can write that down. It speaks of Ashel and Abner. And in particular, their, their, their battle. Scripture says Ashel was fast as a gazelle, and he preserved, or pursued Abner in battle. Abner had no chance of outrunning Ashel, but guess what? Abner had a spear. And what's interesting about that text there in 2 Samuel 2 is that, that, that he is pursuing Ashel is pursuing Abner in, in this foot race. And, and Abner's looking over his shoulder, and he sees Ashel coming, and he says, listen, turn to the left. He goes, no, I'm coming after you. No, turn to the right. And Ashel says, no, I'm coming after you, Abner. When Abner turned around, knowing that he was slow of foot, and he took the butt of his spear, Scripture says, and jabbed, jabbed Ashel in the stomach and held him, and he died. The fastest doesn't always win. Speaking of battles, usually the strongest man wins, doesn't it? But sometimes the weaker man wins. 
I remember one time I was a baseball coach and, um, at the Masters College, and, and I had some pretty strapping young men, men who, who were in physical uh, ability, and, and they kept on picking on the coach. And I said, listen, you better watch out because this old bear can still do some mean tricks. Well, hey, they took that as a challenge. And uh, one day, I had one guy just jump on my back and says, Bear, I'm taking you down, to which I just kicked into the gear. And he was stronger, faster, and definitely <laughs> um, not smarter, however, because I was able to put him on the... And all the team kind of looked at that and just said, Whoa, um, don't mess with Coach Bear. Um, of course, I, I used my wits to outsmart him and put him in a place of, of where there's some pressure points that he just quickly melted. <laughs> And uh, I walked away, with, of course, with pride on my, on my chest and uh, never had another problem with him again. Um, not that he was a problem. He just thought, I think men sometimes feel like they're, they're stronger, better, and bigger. However, there's, there is scripture. I think probably the most famous example of what, what we're talking about here and what Solomon's talking about is David and Goliath. Often used in today's sporting events about the underdog, David, of course, as we well know, uh, one with the Lord on his side, beating the tremendous foe that Goliath was. Solomon recognizes that. And he also says not only is it just the fast and the strong that lose at times, but it's also the wise and the wealthy. Look at verse 11 again. He says, And neither is bread to the wise, nor wealth to the discerning. Pretty interesting. Ordinarily, we would expect someone with superior mind to, and to, to, to be able to be something in society and to gain, to gain things according to their wisdom. That's not always the case. I've met some smart men who do not own homes and who find themselves in, in very needy situations. Smarter than a lot of us. How about the stock market? Think about that. In the day and age where, where man feels like he, he has a, a feeling of what to do when it comes to investing, and, and yet just in a, a moment's notice, all of that can come crashing down. Well, Solomon is wise here. He, he's true. It's true. Wise do not always have bread. Intelligent does not always guarantee a good income. Having a lot of knowledge will not necessarily do you any favors is this point. Let me just say it this way. In short, human ability has no guarantee to and for success. I think that's what Solomon observed. He looked at life and he realized that, that you can do everything you can to equip yourself with your human ability, but, but in the end, it too can fail. Disaster can overtake any one of us at any time. And Solomon says, time and chance happen to us all. It comes upon us unexpectedly. Now, like I said before, Solomon's phrase here doesn't deny the sovereignty of God. It's not that, that Solomon is saying that, that, that we are useless and helpless and thus might as well just cruel up and die. He's just noting the fact that, that, that these things fall upon us and, and we don't even sign up for them sometimes. He doesn't deny the sovereignty of God. He's just pointing to the very fact from our perspective things happen like this. For scriptures has told us the mind of God and we know with, a, with certainty that even when uncertainty comes, that God is not uncertain in his ways. We know that God works all things according to the counsel of his will, right? In Ephesians 1.11, let me read it to you. Speaking about our Lord, the scripture says this, Also we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to his purpose, who works all things after the counsel of his will, to the end that we who are were the first to hope in the glory would be to the praise of his glory. That gives us peace. Even though life might be uncertain, we have the certainty of a sovereign God who, who holds all things in his hands and, and according to Romans 8, that, that he desires to do good for those who trust and believe in him. 
Everything is under his, his wise providence and his sovereign control. As a Christian, we understand from, from the biblical understanding of God, nothing happens arbitrarily, right? Everything is subject to God's authority. And that brings us peace, and we'll hit on that in a little bit later. However, from our perspective, there seems to be uncertainty at times, and we don't necessarily know what God is doing. At times, it's not revealed to us. No matter how strong we are or how smart we are, many bad things happen to us in life, and there's no way for us to, to predict what will happen. Solomon's already told us, he's already told us that there is a time for everything under the sun. Here he tells us that we do not, however, know when and what that time will be. Look at verse 12 with me. He goes, moreover, man does not know his time. Like fish caught in a treacherous net and birds trapped in a snare, so the sons of men are ensnared at an evil time when it suddenly falls on them. Practical examples of creation, right? The fish. They see a lure, they see bait. Uh, they're not looking there and looking at the strain. They're not sitting there thinking, that looks odd. It seems out of place. It's a little bit too shiny. They see food, and what do they do? They grasp it until they hit that hook, and what do they do? They fight with all their might to try to get off. Same thing with a bird. We used to have a batting cage in our backyard, and when Josh was playing baseball, and, and a bird so happened to get, fix himself in that net, and he was flying around trying to figure out the hole that he came in from frantically trying to get out of this, uh, this, this netting. Same thing happens to us. Time and chance happen to us. The word time here refers generally to the seasons of life. There are certain things that, that happen in our life, and, and actually this speaks, the Hebrew word speaks about the whole issue of, of life in its entirety. There are times where, where uncertain things happen. Sometimes events will overtake us. And before we know it, we get trapped in a bad situation, possibly at work, at home, in, in the world. Or, how about this? I'm often surprised when those who seem the most healthiest get a disease, a cancer, something that, that, that just takes them suddenly. At the very least, Solomon recognized it will come a time for us to die a time in which none of us knows. And if time doesn't overcome you, he, he notices and takes a, a mention of this, this word chance. And I want to make a mention of that because it's not like the word we would think of in our English vocabulary. This word chance has, has, a, has a, it's not some kind of luck. Literally in the Hebrew, it means fate. It means it remind, uh, a certain time, uh, an instance of life something that happens to us. And according to the context of verse 12, the, in, in the scenarios and the example he gives us with the fish and the birds, it, it, we're talking about something that, is, that evil comes upon us, some kind of evil fate or time. And it makes sense, right? In a fallen world, that many unhappy evil things happen every day, Right? You turn on your TV, you will find that, that innocent people are being killed by some senseless act from our perspective. Some deranged man killing students or whatever the case may be. How about disasters? They hit our world often, don't they? Life is unpredictable from our point of view. It has its misfortune. I think what's interesting about this is as we reread these two verses, I want you to see something. Can you see what God is telling us through these two verses? Hopefully you can. In essence, he's saying this. In God's mercy, he tells us to expect the unexpected. It, things shouldn't come at us with a surprise. If life is uncertain, we need to embrace that. And he's revealed that through Solomon. He's revealed that through us in life. When hardships comes, even when it comes very suddenly, we should not be surprised at them because that's commonplace in this fallen world. Nor when life is good should we think that our own natural abilities would spare us from having hard times. Just because things are going good doesn't mean that, that, that you're immune from, from what's going to happen next. 
The Word of God is simply telling us no matter how gifted we are or, or how well prepared we might be or how many advantages we have in life, we too may suffer an evil day living in this fallen world. Don't be surprised. That's what Solomon's trying to say. Don't be surprised. Now, knowing that uncertainty is sure to come our way, how do we respond with that? And that's what I love about the Scriptures. It doesn't leave us hanging with, with the despair of the reality of this life, that it's, it, it's all uncertain, and, and we walk on eggshells, and we live with uncertainty. But, but don't, he's actually saying, hey, listen, there is answers. And he gives us in the following verses, verses 13 through 18, these, this answer on how we were to respond to uncertainty. He answers the question, how should we live with uncertainty that sometimes come at us and could happen at any time? He says wisdom has an example. What's interesting to me is that, that Solomon gives us an example exactly what it looks like for one to live in an uncertain rural world and he gives it through this whole lens of wisdom. He says, look at wisdom example. Look at verse 13. He says, also, this I came to see as wisdom under the sun. This is something Solomon experienced, right? And it impressed me, is what he says. There was a small city with few men in it, and a great king came to it, surrounded it, and constructed large siege works against it. But there was found in it a poor wise man, and he delivered the city by his wisdom. Yet no one remembered that poor man. True account, observed by Solomon himself. In this case, a, a wise poor man saved a city from instant destruction. There's no reason for, for the city to, to, to stand what was coming against them. Now, it's interesting, Solomon doesn't tell us how he did it. He just points out the fact that there was a wise poor man who was able to ask and call the city to, to obey what he had laid before him. The fact remains that wisdom saved that city, and that was Solomon's point. He's trying to search the scriptures, he's trying to figure out exactly if there was, a, if there was something that, that would be there. We, we do have an account of a, of a woman that helped the city but, and, and Samuel, but it, 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 he's talking about here a, a wise poor man, and, and so trying to figure out where that is. However, trusting in the scriptures, we know that Solomon witnessed this. Solomon's discernment of such ordeal was, was something of greatness. He was in awe of this fact. The city had, no, like I said, no chance to survive. Its defenders were totally outnumbered. Their enemies were, were led by a powerful king who, who had the latest military stuff. We could say it this way, humanly speaking, they didn't have a prayer. But as we know, with the Lord, all things are possible, right? Church, are you awake? All things are possible in the Lord. The battle is not always to the strong. That's what he just taught us, right? In this particular case, one man knew exactly what to do, and Solomon saw this example of what wisdom can do. Unhappy is that city as they responded to this wisdom because it rescued their, their lives. What's interesting about this, you would think that this guy would now be crowned a hero. You would think that this guy would have his statues. But look at the end of verse 15. What does it say there? Yet no one remembered that poor man. Despite the good deed that he had done, no one remembered him. People went on living their lives with, with, without remembrance of the one who was used by the Lord to, to, to impart wisdom to save a city. We understand that, don't we? People are fickle. People that go about and, and the tragedy that was upon them is now soon forgotten because now they got their, their normal way of life. I think it's kind of interesting that he would point that out. But here's Solomon's point. Even if you're not remembered for the wisdom that the Lord gives you, it still has advantages. And that was his point. Look at wisdom can bring you uh, from, from the Lord himself to be able to... to ascertain a situation, to live righteously, and, and even protect. That's the kind of wisdom I pray as a dad. Hopefully you pray for that as well. Decisions that you make within your families are, are, are protected by the wisdom of God and the tr 
truth and word of God so you can lead your families? Wisdom has its advantages. Sure, some people will forget you and it won't make you famous, but nonetheless, it is a valuable resource. This is Solomon's point. And he proves that value in what he says in the following verses, in verses 16 through 18. He says there in verse 16, he says, So I said, wisdom is better than strength. As he looked at that situation, he understood that wisdom was far outgained the strength and the might of that king. But the wisdom of the poor man is despised, and his words are not heeded. Fortunately, the poor man who saved the city was able to, to get the people to listen to what he had to say, but it doesn't always work out that way, does it? Sometimes you are a voice in the wilderness crying out to, 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 to a world that is dying and lost, and they just ignore you and go about their way and do their things. Sometimes people refuse to listen to the words of wisdom. Nevertheless, Solomon's point is that that. That godly wisdom is, is better than any might, power, or strength. And throughout this chapter, we've been looking at this whole issue that, that wisdom is not only to be sought after, but a wise man will, will listen to it. And, and I think that's what we desire as Christians, to have our, our heart attuned to, to what the Word of God says. And then our ears perk up and our heart gains attention and we saturate the things that when, when we know that the Spirit is speaking and the Word of God is, is, is addressing our souls. This is exactly what Solomon says in verses 17 and 18. Look at it with me. He says, The words of the wise heard in quietness are better than the shouting of a ruler among fools. Wisdom is better than weapons of war, but one sinner destroys much good. Verse 17 describes a, a loud mouth leader, somebody who, who is flamboyant in their approach, but is full of vanity, hot air, when it speaks to life. I think the point that Solomon is pointing out is that it's just because someone is loud or often his voice is heard or forced upon someone doesn't mean that they are always wise. We feel like that when we come to election day, don't we, sometimes? Solomon says there's, there's a better way to lead. A wise man does not feel the need to do a lot of shouting. In other words, and I think you can find examples of that in your life, men, women, children who, who love the Lord and, and they lead with their quietness. Their actions and what they say are profound, that, that, that it a cause to drown out all the other things of, of life. People's hearts are changed when such people speak from the Scriptures and uphold the things of the Word of God. A godly word at an appointed time has stirred my soul in, in great direction towards the things of godliness. I'm pretty sure that you can account to that as well. A leader doesn't have to speak loud. Just God's truth and what's interesting is that what Solomon says, that such way of living, such way of leading, often shuts the mouths of fools. Jesus did that, didn't he? The accounts of the Gospels, when, when you see Jesus interact with the Pharisees or, or his, 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 his people, his enemies, let me just say it that way, he often would shut down a conversation with a, with a point of truth that judged their heart and put them in their place. Solomon says, the words of the wise heard in quietness are, are better than the shouting of a ruler among fools. By saying this, wisdom is better than weapons of war, but one sinner destroys much good. It's not that Solomon's saying that there's, there's not a time for war or anything. He's just pointing out the fact that wisdom is superior when it comes to weapons. I think we can understand that. I like what Proverbs says. Solomon himself writing this, he says this in Proverbs 15.1, a gentle answer turns away wrath, but harsh words stir up anger. Speaking about relationships, how do you respond? Have you found that truth to be wise and acceptable? Does the calmness of your own spirit diffuse situations and bring 
to light what is at hand? Someone points out that, however, that one sinner can destroy much good. In other words, sin can destroy that which wisdom brings by the action of one individual. When we don't listen to the truth of Scripture, we don't follow it. We are often haunted by the, by the sin we do. Here's a small example that kind of is a little bit away. Uh, we were up at camp, and the little Barnes boys had a, and, and girl had the, uh, the little flyer thing. And I'm trying to figure out what it was. It was this little thing, a little halo thing. You pull this, and the thing went up, and it lit up, and it flied around. And I was watching these kids do it, and they were doing it pretty masterful. And I thought to myself, I can do that. And so Josh gave me the little thing, and I pulled it, and it just went, boo I'm like, you've got to be kidding me. We're inside the deal, and, and this words of wisdom came my way from Nicole. She said, listen, if you pull that hard, it ha- will have the tendency to fly off and break a light. So what does your pastor do? I'm like, yeah, right. And I pulled that thing, and sure enough, in a moment second, that thing went up, hit one of the lights, and broke, and Josh's glass was flying everywhere, and I'm like, and the words of haunting if you pull that thing too hard, you're going to break the light, came to fruition. And it it echoed my heart, and and I was thinking to myself, she told me that's what's going to happen. Had to apologize to the camp host and said I broke a light and had to apologize to two crying kids. Actually, they weren't crying. They were just looking at this thing, and they probably thought it was kind of cool because fireworks were going everywhere. By the way, I have a couple toys for you. Because not only did I break the light, but I broke their toy. So, so uh, that will be coming to you. You know, what's, you know the joy of kids, though? They, they didn't just sit there and mourn over the fact that now their toy was altered and broken. what they do? They kept on playing with it. And I kind of felt bad because it never flew like it was supposed to fly. Words of wisdom. Going back to this whole issue of, of sin, one sinner destroys much good. Turn back in your Bibles. I think there's a great biblical account. Back to Joshua. If you guys remember Joshua and his call to take the land of Canaan, why don't you turn to Joshua chapter um, 7. Pretty specific orders. As Joshua was promised, of course, this land, Moses was promised this land, and we got this scenario out of Joshua chapter 7 where, where one sin affected them all. And of course, that was the battle at Ai. It's pretty interesting that um, Joshua was concerned about following exactly what the Lord had commanded them to do, and they ended up losing this battle. And the Lord came, and look at verse 11 there, verse Ch- Joshua chapter 7. He tells Joshua... After Joshua asked what happened here, verse 11 says, Israel has sinned, and they have also transgressed my covenant, which I commanded them. And they have even taken some things under the ban and have both stolen and deceived. Moreover, they have also put them among their own things. Therefore, the Lord said, the sons of Israel cannot stand before their enemies. They turn their backs before their enemies if they have become accursed. I will not be with you anymore unless you destroy the things under the ban from your midst. And so Joshua knew, he heard this call, and there was this whole issue that there was sin in the camp, right? And so he starts asking certain men, have you disobeyed? He went to family to family. Skip forward to verse 19. Then Joshua said to Achan, my son, I implore you, give glory to the Lord, to the God of Israel, and give praise to him, and tell me now, What you have done, do not hide it from me. So Achan answered Joshua and said, Truly, I have sinned. He sniffed it out. He found it. Achan was the man. Everything was going right in Israel's favor as they were trying to to come into this promised land. Achan admits his sin. Verse 21, When I saw among the spoil a beautiful mantle, this is is Achan's talking about the riches of the people that he, that he conquered from Shinar and 200 shekels of silver and a bar of gold, 50 shekels in weight. And then I coveted them and took them, and behold, they are concealed in the earth inside my tent with the silver underneath it. Now, you would think that that would be good and plenty, right? Achan confesses his sin. Look at verse 22. The seriousness of God's pursuit of, of righteousness and holiness. So, 
Verse 22, so Joshua sent messengers and they ran to the tent. Behold, it was concealed in this tent with the silver underneath it. They took them from inside the tent and brought them to Joshua until all the sons of Israel, and they poured them out before the Lord. The whole nation saw all this. They were commanded not to take anything. Remember, God was going to be their provider, and here Achan has the stuff, and, and now they're before the whole nation, and, and, and all their, uh, their, their stuff that they told is before them. Verse 24, Then Joshua and all Israel with him took Achan, the son of Zerah, the silver, the mantle, and the bar of gold, his sons, his daughters, his oxen, his donkeys, his sheep, his tent, and all that belonged to him, and they brought them up to the valley of Acre. Everything that Achan was, all printed, presented before the Israel. And listen to verse 25, and Joshua said, Why have you troubled us? The Lord will trouble you this day. And all Israel stoned them with stones, and they burned them with fire after they had stoned them with stones. And they raised over him a great heap of stones that stands to this day. And the Lord turned from the fierceness of his anger. Therefore, the name of the place has been called the Valley of Achor to this day. Wow. One disobedient in the camp. And God showing his anger towards their disobedience and was a great reminder. We had that in the New Testament, in Acts chapter 5, with Ananias and Sapphira. What's interesting about that is, is that God doesn't do that. You know, the very fact that he has brought his son, he's brought forgiveness, he's brought someone that we can turn to and we can repent, fall on our faces, understand that the grace of Christ can forgive us of those things. But what an example. What an example. That one sinner can destroy that which can bring forth in what God calls us to be. What's the, what's, the, what's the point of that? Let's be quick to seek forgiveness. Let's be quick to understand that you're dealing with a holy God and, and that he doesn't allow us to play with that sin. Let us run to the mercy and grace of Christ. What's interesting, Achan sin affected his whole family, didn't it? I don't know if his, the scripture doesn't say if his sons and daughters were a part of that. Probably were not because they weren't ones who would go out to battle. It was definitely Achan bringing that back in. And, and, and he, don't doubt, made them corroborate that, hey, we're going to hide this stuff. This is for our good. And sometimes we can do that. Men, listen up here. Don't justify something that is sinful when you know it's sinful and make your family follow that. That humbles us. That humbles us. It's a great reminder that we need to repent and confess our sins to the only one who can cleanse us from our sins, and that, of course, is Jesus. And that is acceptable and accessible daily and a moment's notice. Let me wrap this up for us. Turn back to Ecclesiastes. Solomon tells us, in a world that, that is full of time and chance, with the uncertainty of life, we at any time may suffer loss, we may, may suffer hardship at any moment. Even He tells us even the swift lose the race, even the strong may get defeated in battle, even the smart may suffer poverty. Nor do any of us know how much time we have left. Don't be such a fool. I visit the hospital on a, almost a weekly occurrence and I hear the stories of, of the sudden turn of, of health. So I guess what Solomon says, in essence, what is the wisest way for us to, to, to live with the time that we do have left? And let me say this. This side of the cross, we understand that, that the, the very first thing and, and, and what needs to be consuming our minds with knowing that life and its uncertainties and with the time that you do have left, no matter how old you are in this facility and if you have ears, is that we need to follow and serve the Lord. That exhortation is very clear. We need to follow Christ. That is the wisest thing any one of us can do. Receiving the grace 
that is given in Christ Jesus for the remission of our sins. We need to understand that, that we serve a Savior who has paid it all. Not some of it, but all of it. And giving our lives to Him, that far is the wisest thing that the Scripture would call us to do, to serve Christ with all that we are. And let nothing hold you back. Nothing. For in Christ we have redemption. In, in Christ we have, a, uh, have received this, this reconciliation. In Christ we have been adopted to this kingdom. And I don't know about you, but denying self, Christ says we need to do that and take up our cross and follow Christ. He is Lord. He is Savior. And with the uncertainty of life, that is the only stability that we have. And guess what? This is what God wants you to do. This is what he wants you to do. Oh, I think about our Lord, all the fullness of God that's dwelt upon him. And, and then as you read Ephesians, all the things that he's blessed you with, what more do we want to do, beloved? He's given you the ability to, to see life through his eyes, to receive the grace and mercy, and to have a theological perspective of, of what's going on. I think of it this way. Without the Lord and pursuing him, we are hopeless. But with Christ at the center of your life, you will see clearly as he sees. Your heart will beat his pulse. He gives us the word of all wisdom, a living, inspired word that, that, that guides our paths. He gives us the Holy Spirit in which to enact those things. What more do you need, beloved? What, what, what more do you need? The word of God, the Holy Spirit, this relationship that is vital to our souls, a word of God that, that doesn't return void. It's always true. It's always right. That's wisdom that God gives us. It brings us peace, doesn't it? A peace that the scripture says passes all understandings, even in the midst of uncertainties of life. So, let me wrap it up by saying this. When life brings its uncertainty, we hold on to the certainty of God. Amen? When life brings us trials, we hold on to the joy and consider it pure joy as the Lord undergirds us in the midst of that trial. James chapter 1, amen? When life brings us anxious moments, we hold on to the surety and the sovereignty of God who is in control of all things. When the world tells us to run from God, God's word tells us to hold on to him and to be faithful to the race that he's called you to. Wisdom. Showing us an example. It's giving us this value. And it's all wrapped up in who Christ is. Let me say it this way. Wisdom is wrapped up in the salvation and the life of Jesus Christ. Do you find him sufficient? like the old song says, learn this as, as a young believer, trust and obey, trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus than to trust and obey. We're reminded of that in Joshua, we're reminded of that throughout the scriptures. Will we put feet to that truth? Let us pray. Father, we, we thank you for the great reminder to not be surprised by the uncertainties of life, not to be shocked, and it overcomes. It overcomes us like a, like a wave. And yet as it settles, we, as we grasp for air, we, we know with certainty that you are a God who sits on his throne, who is sovereign, who is omniscient, who is omnipresent. All the characters just scream out at us as we, we think about the uncertainties of this life. It gives us peace. It gives us hope. For the believer, that's what we cling to. And for the unbeliever, that's what we proclaim. 
We, we, we beg them and beseech them to see this Jesus who has come to save them, to give them hope, to give them forgiveness of their sins, to, to pay the penalty of what their sin has brought. Thank you, Jesus, for your faithfulness. Thank you for your stability and that you are the anchor of our souls. And may we grasp that. May we hold on to that. May we believe that. And that exhortation, is, as much as it gives us comfort, doesn't stop there. It, it, it causes us to be all that you've called us to be. Because I'm in Christ Jesus, you have, have flung me into a world to be salt and light and to be one who has this message of hope. Help us. Help us to deny ourselves and take up the cross and to follow you. Do that in small ways. Do that in big ways. Do it, Spirit, in whatever ways that you are pounding on our hearts. And may the fire rage. And may we burn deep within. And may the church be alive to the things that matters most. Thank you for your grace. And thank you for your mercy. We pray these things in Christ's name. Amen.